Welcome everyone, I'm Melpa D'Souza. I'm a researcher at Thompson River University. I am situated and grounded on the traditional and unceded territory of Shepnukak Ulu. And I work with the Shepnukna nation and the people uh, belonging to the Shepnuk Ulu. My work here is related to cancer research and the interdisciplinary approaches to psychosocial cancer and uh, the journey of people who go through living with cancer, caregivers, care partners, and their family members during the time of the screening, the diagnosis, the treatment, post-treatment, survivorship. So my major work in this research work is the intersectionality lens of frame in which I look at the identity of people and look at how it intersections with their healthcare access and use and also with the psychosocial supports, emotional support and the education they have along the way when they are being diagnosed with cancer, treated and post-treatment. So majority of the people who are working with is the different organizations, community organizations, healthcare organizations and the work of the research participants who along with all these um, communities they belong to and the families they belong to have been part of the research. This research mainly focuses on looking at safe, culturally appropriate healthcare behaviors and healthcare support care for what is required for people and what is needed for them in the journey. So the major focus is looking at social justice, self-determination and also looking at psychosocial education and interdisciplinary approaches for different people and for the nature of uh, care and treatment they are looking for in the community resources and also for their own health and well-being. So one of the priority of the research is to look at cancer navigation and cancer supports for people living with cancer and for their caregivers and care partners who are along with them on this journey. The second part of this research is looking at policies and recommendations with psychosocial oncology nursing, with psychosocial interdisciplinary approaches, and also with an online educational hub. So we have a cancer innovation and synergy lab at Thompson River University, where we are looking into different aspects of the journey of a person with cancer and the cancer care education network, the cancer care policies and recommendations, the cancer care implications and recommendations for people. And at this point, we have with us today different speakers, uh, keynote, plenary and guest speakers who are going to share their insights and perspectives as part of the research grant that we're working on and also looking at how we can extend this work to different provinces in Canada and in the international world. So I welcome you to the session that we are having today on interdisciplinary approaches to psychosocial oncology and our guest speakers who will be here today. Thank you. Welcome everyone, I'm Melba D'Souza, I'm a registered practicing nurse and I'm also a nurse researcher at the Thompson River University School of Nursing. Today we are going to have an interdisciplinary approach to psychosocial oncology network presentation with keynote speakers, plenary speakers and a guest speaker who will be on our show to talk about some of the important insights and perspectives that have uh, taken place in our research grant. One of the important part of our research grant is looking at intersectional dimensions and with an intersectional lens on the identities of people, ethnicities, the distribution with regard to their own community so resources and support. And the second part of this research is looking at cancer navigation and cancer supportive care for people living with cancer in the interior region in British Columbia. The main outcome of this research would be looking at an online educational hub for 
people living with cancer, for professional navigators who help and support people living with cancer, and also for Cancer Innovation and Synergy Lab, working with partners and with organizations across British Columbia and Canada provinces. The main outcome of this research is that people, part, research participants who had the experience and perception of living with cancer has been an integral part for them to understand and to apply the different prospects of how they can navigate the cancer journey and also looking at their own navigation and supports while they are doing different treatments in cancer, cancer chemotherapy, radiation and different aspects of cancer. So we would be happy to have you with us today in this interdisciplinary approaches to psychosocial oncology and also to look at the future of interdisciplinary approaches of psychosocial oncology in British Columbia. Thank you. Welcome everyone, I am Melba D'Souza and I am a researcher at Thompson River University. Today we have a Knowledge Translation Cancer Care Network Consortium and we will have a few guest speakers, uh, keynote speakers and plenary speaker. Uh, in our research grant, one of the main things we were looking and studying was the cancer survivors and people who are diagnosed with cancer and treated, how is their journey been with cancer support care and psychosocial care and even educational care. So some of the outcomes, recommendations and policy is brought together as a knowledge translation and through this we are advocating for interdisciplinary approaches and psychosocial oncology with the work that we are doing. Today we have with us Michelle Smith and she has been a co-investigator in the research grant and working with us to continue the work with knowledge translation. So welcome Michelle Smith. Thank you. And you like to introduce yourself here? Hello, I'm Michelle Smith, a regional practice lead for research quality and knowledge translation in the research department at Interior Health and also adjunct with the Faculty of Social Health and Social Development at UBC Okanagan. So Michelle, thank you very much for introducing yourself and it's so relevant with your work in the research practice and education and your own um, work that you're doing with the research grant that is uh, now with uh, people who are living with cancer and also with people who are seniors. So how do you see this participatory action research and intersectionality lens in the grant working with uh, cancer patients and also with family members? So I think specifically with this project, it was, it was based in the community and participatory action research we mean that it came from the people in the community and their experiences and it was driven by what they saw and so with Malba's project it was I found it was very it was invaluable to that to the people in the community that had the had cancer so community oriented participate participatory action research was the focus of this project with and what was so important about that was that the community was drove the project and as well the all inclusivity of the stakeholders decision makers universities like this came to, to connect about what was important and how to make a change with the, what was needed for um, cancer survivors after post-treatment. So what psychosocial, what supports they need in the community because there often is a gap between treatment and what happens after. And so what this project highlighted was where the needs were and what we could come together to talk about to improve how the quality is and, and what was needed for everybody. Another important aspect of this project was the inter intersectionality approach that, and that really moved from what the community was saying was important to them and what was where the gaps were and where they saw need and what was working and what was, wasn't working was the, the lens of like looking at the experience of the people and bringing that back to the group and discussing how to move forward with that. So looking at the perspective of other people and applying it to how we make the change and including how you apply evidence-based practices and changes to improve the policies and procedures that come out of that as well. 
And that's incredibly important because often policies and procedures are very, they don't change, they don't necessarily change unless you approach it with some evidence-based research that says, look at this is not, there's a gap here. This is continuing healthcare, it's quality of life throughout pre-cancer treatment, cancer treatment and beyond. And that's incredibly important just as much as the treatment piece itself. So what do you think are the policy strategic directives that came out from the study that leaned towards interdisciplinary approaches in psychosocial oncology and its influence with working with people who are living with cancer, their caregivers and care partners? I think one of the things we find is that there tends to be one GP or one, cancer, one yeah. cancer doctor that they see and there's no continuation like to connect that person and their care provider or their family member that's helping them with other support systems. And if there's no policy, like right now there's no policy in place for that. It's like tre treatment and then you're off and then the rest of it, it depends on what the community supports are and it, there's no policy about how to follow through with cancer survivors through their community and supporting them for, through, through their next steps and including does it end or does it, is there a remission and does it come back? Mm -hmm. And like, how do they navigate that? Mm -hmm. And I think policies in place that can talk about recognizing that quality of life is as important as the care treatment itself, because it's intertwined, it's not one or the other. So the, the and it, I find like working in the health authority areas with the healthcare system, that if it's not highlighted in a policy or procedure, there's just, no, there's, it's not possible to like manage that piece. It has to be recognized as something that has to be done and it has to be outlined in a policy or procedure or it's not part of the process. Like, yeah. And then no, and with this type of research, you're ask, actually asking them what happens after you leave this part and you go back to the community. Malva, what help do you envision in interdisciplinary approaches in psycho psychosocial oncology? Thank you, Michelle. This is a very good question. I think one of the main aspects that came out from the research study was communication with healthcare providers and research participants. And the second was about funding issues with different aspects related to travel, accommodation, stay with medications and treatment aspects. And the after treatment was the major part where people have to get back to their life. Uh, especially return to work and with their own quality of life, getting back, normalizing their life into things that they usually do and getting that rhythm back into their life. So with these two things, I think one of the uh, main aspects that came up was to create a cancer innovation and synergy lab that we have uh, with working with research participants. And the second was an online educational hub for people and for navigators where they can get resources and supports uh, through their cancer journey and also for the navigator to help and support people and empower them in their journey. Thank you, yes. That, and then so the geography of an interior health region is incredible all, all across yes. the rest of BC. So the just the ability to know what to do from where you're at. Yes. And know how to find it. Yes, like with funding huge. issues, the main thing was with for the people, the access and the use of the cancer care resources and support within their own community, especially if they were in a remote area like a, or in even in a rural area, example like living in Revelstoke yeah. or living even in um, Barrier, Clearwater, Williams Lake. So being able to access the support they need in cancer care and also to navigate their own cancer care journey and also being able to help and support themselves after the treatment. So the, the resources they need to reach out to the kind of um, things that change in their life because of ca what cancer and the treatment has been on them has been a huge impact on their own quality of life, on their own economic impact, and also about being able to facilitate their journey in cancer. That's it's impactful because I think like a lot of it's not recognized often that the people's lives in those areas, and then seasonally, yes, the winter, the snow passes, the yes. people don't expect to be ill, and they're trying to do everything when they're not feeling well already in their quality of life and having to seek help for themselves is very yeah. challenging in the hard, yeah, hard envi harsh environments all over the place. True, that, that was the main focus of our research study. It was looking at mainly the barriers that people face and the facilitators, especially with healthcare services, with complementary and alternative therapies, with their own economic and social supports, and also with their own family and their own activities of daily living and also looking at psychosocial dimensions. So that was the major aspects that people, what they find available and being able to access. 
and this leans on to also some aspect of it has when they access cancer treatment and diagnostics where they need to travel and how they need to access the resources in their own community. It also uh, brings to understanding some of the psychosocial oncology pieces as to how the healthcare provider or the nurse provides this support to the person when they meet them for the first time in an environment maybe in the clinic or in a hospital place or even in the community when they transition and go back to the community. So how telehealth and the telephone helplines, even community resources, even the webinars that are placed out for psychosocial education and how that can help a person um, returning to life and being able to live, uh, living with cancer and still continuing to work and being part of society and the community they belong to. So Michelle, thank you very much for uh, giving us a lens into intersectionality and participatory action. So I do understand that this research participants are from all over the entire region and, for Brit and also from British Columbia. So what is your, uh, when you look at uh, policy implications and recommendations for seniors health and wellness with cancer care and with the knowledge translation, how do you see that as happening or something that we need to look at and talk about? And how the perspective from the participants saw as, as well in, in amongst that, like reflecting on what they're saying, yeah. is that having an interest or like a, 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 a wide group of support, yes. so they have their, 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 the full communication of a multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary team mm -hmm. that can follow them through each step because it's not just, you know, the weight of one physician to try to manage all those pieces of their care, but mm -hmm. be able to like have care plans and work in a way that is a comprehensive care plan that they can have pieces and everyone knows how they're supporting that per, that person, including their, mm -hmm. if they hopefully have a family member or someone that can actually provide extra support for them. Mm -hmm. And then the, the other thing is, and I think this comes up a lot, is how to share the education or the knowledge translation piece, like how do people access yeah. that information? Because some people, like depending on age or exposure or what they're comfortable with or what how they want to view things, you know, yeah. visually or orally or whatever, but the just multiple ways to access and also to various languages like BC is in all different parts is growing more with more different languages that we need to be able to respond to and have the proper communication and materials that they can access and, and up to date relevant information that reflects current research about yeah. what's the best practices to do. And, not, and have that at every step of the way and have ways that they can access, you know, printed materials in the clinic, mm -hmm. mailed to them, yes, emailed to them. Like there's a variety of ways to do it. And I think there's never one perfect way. I think in other yeah. discussions as well, there's always so many ways that people prefer different means of accessing yeah. that, but more and readability, like not giant sheets of reading. Yes. I think that's part of... Yeah knowledge translation. I think that's an that. important part also for decision support when they're yeah. looking at how they're making decisions, informed decisions with their care aspect. Like when they're choosing the kind of diagnostics and even the treatment part of it, it plays a role. And even after treatment, the kind of decisions they go with for the different aspects that come with the activities of living or return to work, decisions with how they want or priorities they want to change uh, with taking care of themselves or even with their family members. So how do you see that people are using these decision support tools or applications available in the community or with the healthcare services? Yeah, how to be able to access those. Yes. And that's complicated unless it's kind of with through the same system, there's a continuum of care and system of how that can happen. But the, and the, the information for that physician that they're, that they're dealing with, it, it helps, not, sorry, the, the physician that they're seeing for their treatment as well, if they can yeah. have, that in their back pocket to be able to share with that with that patient that or their family member to help move forward with what else that they can do because I think also it's you know they're seeing people as they yes. can and they don't have access to it and it's and I find other things I found in this and other projects as well when you're trying to share information is that it has to be really fast and easy for them to share they're not yes. going to seek it out like you mm -hmm. can give people all kinds of doctors or anyone links they can read and access the links but they're not they don't have time to like they need it needs to be simple and straightforward and something they can pass along quickly to 
and like make it comfortable for that patient to that person and their family to be able to access that because sometimes I think it's a bit you know in and out and they just don't want to ask like I think almost they don't don't feel comfortable asking for support but you know a system like a navigator yeah. or the website or different ways people can access information is more comfortable to people sometimes as well so you're not always just relying on the one person to share all that information I think I think you brought up a very important point about sharing information and resources at the same time like an educational hub for them or mm -hmm. even a repository where these resources can be accessed and also about a professional navigator to empower them and help and support them on their journey. So when you look at this navigator's role and also about people on their own journey, what implications it has for psychosocial oncology and how has interdisciplinary approaches, we approach people with how yeah. they take care with their own life after cancer treatment. Yeah, and different aspects from different people, social workers, nursing, all yes. the different community organizations. So everyone has a different view and comes with a different experience or discipline or, or they come from when they're training or uh, they've ex had cancer themselves or their family members had cancer themselves. And so they have that perspective because I think when you're coming in brand new, you don't know you're sick mm -hmm. and you don't know what to expect. And I think the best people to have is somebody that has experience and, and also can also rally the other people together to help you know who to seek for what. Like where do you get the hair pieces that are like I've heard are way too expensive yes, and not covered just on the side, things mm -hmm. like that. And then how do they know? Like a, I have a family member that's kind of just uh, has breast, breast, breast cancer that's just come back mm -hmm. and they live even farther north than we do and they're traveling to get to everything and just mm -hmm. there's no communication when it comes to when it separates across um, communities as well. Yeah. So the materials and education that recognizes that's transferable mm -hmm. to other communities, or at least there's understanding what community they're from and where their main treatment center might be yeah. and things like that. So there's a long way to go. And I think when we try to even arrange in-person things with anybody to like for treatments or meetings, like ge the geography is mm -hmm. just, we have to some, sometimes surpass, how do we surpass that? I guess it's the question we always have too, which yeah. is online supports and education and people and, and also, People, if they're doing that, how do they, you know, if it's a volunteer person and they're a community person, they have all this experience, but they're doing it for free. Mm -hmm. Like that, how often can that, where can that go for? Like they yes. need to be able to like fund or support services like that, because especially in the, the rural and remote communities, there's not enough people and you're gonna rely on one person that may or may not be there or may they may have other things that family and work they need to do. So just a lot of how do we support that and put that in a, policy procedures processes in place at that, that it doesn't stop at the door of the treatment and then it, everyone's left to figure it out on themselves and then people are providing free service to support. So that's the other, like often that's the case with the community support groups and everything. Yeah, I, I hear what you're saying because even from the research study, the kind of decision support people take is based on the access and the use of the healthcare yeah. uh, and the community resources they have. So one of the choice that they make is with uh, choosing maybe treatments or cancer treatments based on where they are living and how much they need to travel and who's at home. So even uh, sometimes it's about the side effects of the treatment that they have and what are they navigating in life at that point with maybe the time they are placed at, maybe in work or in education or being a family member taking care of their family. So that influences their choice of selecting the kind of treatment they need and also about their quality of life. So most often from the research participants view, it is about their own longevity and also about their work productivity and what kind of work they return to and how are they going to continue. So that could be some of the important priorities they have in making decisions about what treatment they choose. And even after treatment, returning to work or returning to their normal life, mm -hmm. it's also about making that decision support as to what's important for their quality of life or even for their own health and well-being. So what are the things that change in their life or what becomes priority now and what are recommendations they take from maybe their own healthcare provider whom they are seeking care as continuity. But if you think about some of the research participants and having an unattached healthcare provider, that makes a, a lot more different for them as to where is their care being navigated or how are their care being documented and how there is continuity of care. So I think there are important learnings from 
uh, shared by the research participants, which translate into knowledge mm -hmm. as to what implications we have for an interdisciplinary approach with psychosocial oncology and also creating this uh, cancer care innovation and support for people through maybe psychosocial oncological education resources and also for having an educational hub where people can access the resource. So I think from your view, there's also something that important that we gather today is about the kind of nature that people have in their own life, that what is priority to them. Like when you talk of intersectionality, here's once again a person's identity, their own cultural, their own language, their own way of seeking, like you said, very, very efficient way, like fact documents, and also readability of those documents and being able to use it in life. Like where, where would they hear the first time about this? It could be with their healthcare provider, listening to this information and facts, but maybe being able to register that information and being able to seek out what's my goal or what action I need to take or commitment to my own action in making decisions. What's the best decision for me to do now or who I need to reach out at the time when I'm feeling, example, when the research participants, some of them voiced about the anxiety depression, stress, unable to sleep. And sometimes it's about physical aspects, like when they voiced out about the pain, the fatigue, the nausea, vomiting, constipation or diarrhea. So it can be this multitude of uh, myriad physical, psychosocial uh, problems, which may again lead to feeling of isolation and loneliness. And hence the important part, again, navigating them with interdisciplinary approaches in psychosocial oncology and being able to see that in the healthcare and also in the community they have. So it could be a local where they are living in rural and remote. It also be maybe in maybe an urban setting and suburb area where they're able to access. And most of that with COVID has changed. Like most of the access has been virtually situated mm -hmm. with telehealth, health and also with mobile clinics going to their mobile vans and yeah. also seeking to get telephone calls with their healthcare provider and arranging that. So thank you very much, Michelle, for your insights and perspective. I think it's a lifelong journey in this research work that we do together mm -hmm. and also looking at what's the best way we can um, support people has, with interdisciplinary approaches in psychosocial oncology. So thank you so much. Uh, Michelle, you did mention about uh, participatory action research and it coming, the research uh, question coming from the community here about their own experience, perception and practices with cancer care. Also, can you just talk about when, when you mentioned like, okay, you had a research team, community partnership and uh, healthcare partnership and collaborators on the grant. How did this add a lens of intersectionality to the work from the beginning, from the time that you have looked at what, what is the experience, perception and practices of people to looking at maybe what are the psychosocial dimensions? And right now where you are looking at cancer navigation and support, how does this intersectionality play a role with your research study? I think what were what was really important and impactful, which is impactful about this study, I believe, is that the intersectionality piece, the lens that was applied, is everyone has various values, beliefs. Mm -hmm. They come from different backgrounds, they, they live in different areas, and so, and as do we, and so as we look, and as do all the, the staff and community and, and healthcare providers, so recognizing that everyone's coming from a different place, which is different than almost that you see with general mm -hmm. health care, where everyone's the same, you know, it's just everyone's a person yeah. and we all apply it this way. But when you look at where people are coming from, what their experiences are, recognizing them and asking what those are, then you actually have a more impactful and, and more rich information to actually make a change because you've actually asked the people and you're looking at it in a way that you're in, being inclusive of all the different values and experiences people have and perspectives that people have and recognizing that they are different mm -hmm. and also that the having that lens of how do we do this appropriately the cultural appropriateness of how we're looking and being respectful and recognizing different like all the different ways to to look at a the study and what the perspectives of people are and then how do we apply that in a way that we can provide the best supports for them in the community they're at and their family yeah, I, I can hear your voice like saying, uh, speaking about the voices of the people here, mm -hmm. their perspectives. And also when you're adding that dimension of including them, like a social inclusion and social justice for people from different streams and walks of life who are working, who are continuing with cancer care and in their continuing journey. And I'm also hearing that piece where you're talking about equity oriented health care. And that's mm -hmm. the most important lens, I think, when you think about an equity oriented uh, health service and system 
that delivers the healthcare service, especially with cancer care, to people who are maybe from pre-screening to diagnosis, mm -hmm. treatment, and also when they survive and their longevity, uh, recurrence and prevention of recurrence, there's a whole lot with a lot with the standards of care, with the standards of practice, with the policies that come with it. And also when you talked about uh, important part of cultural playing a role and even linguistic uh, psychosocial support to mm -hmm. people, it adds so much value to the care that healthcare providers today in our British Columbia system provide to people and also from their own perspectives of how an important role each healthcare provider, a physician, a nurse, a psychosocial person, a social worker, a physiotherapist, a masseur, and all these people together from multidisciplines and interdisciplinary areas, and even research team members play a role in looking at how we can bridge the gap and how we can take cancer care initiatives to the next level of providing innovation and synergy and partnership between the different resources and services we have within British Columbia and also looking at cross-border like our provinces where the best of practices with cancer care navigation mm -hmm. and support is and learning from those practices and how it adds lens to our own psychosocial oncology care reaching out to people. So thank you so much for that lens. Welcome everyone and thank you so much for being with us. Today we are going to have a Knowledge Translation Cancer Care Network Consortium and most of our work has been in the interdisciplinary approaches to psychosocial oncology. So today we have a guest speaker with us, Prashant Kumar Pradhan, who has been part of the research grant. And I will briefly introduce myself, Melba D'Souza, researcher at Thompson River University and Principal Investigator for the Breast Cancer Society of Canada and Thompson River University, working with different partners, Interior Health, BC Cancer, community organizations and research team members. This research leads us to look at different envisioning priorities and processes and even the procedures that we have with psychosocial oncology with clients who work with cancer. So let me introduce uh, Prashant Kumar here. Hello. Uh, my name is Prashant and uh, I'm the graduate research assistant for the nursing team and uh, I'm also sitting at uh, Thompson River University doing my graduation. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm glad to be part of this program. Thank you Prashant, it's good to have you here. Uh, just to uh, give us an insight into what's your role when you think about the research grant and about your vision for interdisciplinary approaches in psychosocial oncology. Uh, how do you envision that in your role here in the research grant? I think it's a, it's a, uh, my role is quite important because I need to analyze the data, uh, survey data and response from the participants because this gives you a clear cut insight. What are the problems? What are the uh, key insights there we have from the data and how it is going to help in the future and provide recommendation to policies. So this is the one aspect. The second thing is because in BC we have cancer patients and when I analyze this data, I also find something which can be done easily and there are so many things that we can use with interdisciplinary approach. So, so that, that's my view on this. So based on the research findings from the research participants in British Columbia, what is your recommendations, policy recommendations and also strategic plan to have a Cancer Innovation Synergy Lab and a knowledge hub for participants and navigators in the region? Yeah, actually, um, with the uh, cancer patients data that we have seen, there are so many dimensions that, that just came up. Culture is one. Uh, second is uh, uh, intervention, pre early intervention, I would say. And there is another targeted approach that we can say. Uh, it, it's, it's very necessary. So when it comes to interdisciplinary approach for this uh, psychosocial cancer, cancer care inter intervention, it is, it is important to understand those aspects cultural sensitive things, uh, you know, include these things from, in, from an early point of view. It, it would be very good to include all of these from the education point of view, uh, because re researchers and uh, uh, caregivers, they are also going to have these insights and they can, they can provide so many things to, to implement. I think it's valid that you bring about the point of implementation. So from the survey and the experiences of people and even the 
data that you're doing on cancer supportive care, what are the important priorities and you think directions we need to take for supporting people in cancer care and also with looking at navigating their journey and helping them with facilitating psychosocial oncology and narrowing the gap so that they get appropriate uh, uh, supports during the journey, emotional and psychological and mental health and well-being yeah. and how that takes place. Uh, what are the next steps in this? Yeah, I think uh, policy. when I was reading the data, when I was analyzing this uh, 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 whole research, I think one common theme that I that, that fascinated me is the fear. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not only during the cancer, it is post-cancer as well. They have fear of uh, economic well-being, they have fear of uh, social well-being, they have uh, fear of you know emotions and everything. So I think fear is one thing which may be addressed by target groups. That, that's the that's approach that we can use. And I think uh, for healthcare authorities, it would be really good to understand these research, background of this research and outcome of this research. Like from this data, what we have seen, what are the evidences that we have, people are talking about their fear and they don't have any targeted support. For an example, uh, if we talk about culture, mm -hmm. in this group of participants, there are different groups from culture point of view they are lacking some sort of social and emotional support for their, for their specific target group. So I think that's one of the key aspects that, that we can, and, and the healthcare authority can also look into it. Yeah, one of, like when you're saying about the participants, it also brings to mind that one of the important thing the participants said was uh, a lot of them were like very satisfied with the care they receive with healthcare services mm -hmm. and also with the cancer care treatment. And also sometimes even if they are approaching uh, interdisciplinary approaches like complementary and alternative therapy mm -hmm. in the resources that they have in their community and also if they have people to support them, the journey becomes much more easier. So choosing the decision to take a kind of a treatment and also after treatment what lies in their recovery and coping plays an important dimension when you think about psychosocial oncology. Yeah. There's also that piece of what competencies has a healthcare provider because they play a major role and they do a very good aspect of looking at people and supporting people in their journey and uh, restoring and promoting their health. But how else can this cultural competency and also the dimension of psychosocial competencies uh, play a role for healthcare providers and participants? What do you see is the role of participants when they engage with their healthcare providers in seeking psychosocial support? So alternative therapies and uh uh, alternate options that, that people seek, I think that visibility should be there. They are getting support, but there is no voice out of the market or mm -hmm. out of the uh, this environment. Uh, other people, how do they know that mm -hmm. this support is available? So I think those social group, those target group, mm -hmm. they can address this problem. They can, mm -hmm. you know, spread awareness. Uh, leadership support from uh, healthcare authorities is also essential because they can also uh, provide resources to promote these kind of supports that it's available how do how do people ut utilize them especially in rural area where people are are not aware about the supports that it is available so i think that's another aspect of this of this research that that just came out and i think it's it's really important to look into that as well yeah i think it's like a belonging when you talk about social inclusion and social justice yeah. and uh, self determination there is a role that each one plays in the capacity that they are fulfilling mm -hmm. to reach out to people and serve them. And also at the same time, as research participants and as a participant in their own journey of uh, healing and cancer, they are reaching out to services in the community and also outside the community and support uh, within the health organization and also with their own uh, family members. Like more better the social support they are receiving and psychosocial and education that helps them seeking treatment in a better way and also making informed decision. At the same time, it also helps them to look out for what supports they would need, like what better they can improve their health and even communicate with other people who are having cancer and also their family members who are going through that. Yeah. Because ultimately, when you're looking at people, when you talk of intersectionality in your research, you look at people with different ages and from different geographic locations like rural and remote. And you're also looking at that angle where people are facing a lot of other crises with mental health and emotional, so how we can help and support them through interdisciplinary approaches in psychosocial oncology. So what do you think are next steps from this research grant? I think
think from this uh, from this research or from this exercise, the next step should be the recommendation to mm. adhere, uh, I mean, to, to design better policies, mm. uh, to better processes, so that uh, leadership and uh, uh, researchers, they can also gain insight into the real data. That's the first thing, because it should not be like research happened, there is a result, but that result is not visible to anyone. Yes. Based on this result, I think a strategy should be there, how to use them, how do we promote uh, other cares, other mm options in the in the in the environment and whatever happened with these patients it has happened but if they have the fear post cancer how do we address them that's the one thing second thing is from the data itself when we plan a research it should also enable uh, those hidden aspects mm. that we want to uh, we could not slice and dice from this current data i think that uh, advanced research should be the option uh, the third thing that I see from this research and from this exercise is uh, leadership Leadership blessing is, is mm -hmm. necessary because they need to provide resources. They need to see this as, a, as an evidence-based mm -hmm. research because this is going to provide a baseline for the next step. The strategy cannot be defined without any evidences. These evidences will be the base for the strategy. And uh, as you mentioned, communication is the key. So for patients who are in the fear or who are uh, experiencing these early symptoms, that communication should be there in the social media, in the groups, and the websites, or any resources that we have, because we need to utilize every resource that we, that we have available. Thank you very much, Prashant. Do you have any questions for me, like as we are going through the research grant? I have one question, because uh, and I think, uh, I mean, this is just from my curiosity. And as I have seen the data, this is just coming up in my head. Is there any resource that researcher can also use for advanced research? Like when they get the data, they analyze this information. Uh, how do they, how, how do they uh, promote or showcase these results to the authorities? Obviously, we are going to provide recommendations. Mm -hmm. But I think it would be important if we have a monthly forum mm -hmm. or a quarterly forum with authorities mm -hmm. and tell them like this is the outcome that we have find, uh, uh, we, we have seen and this is how it's going to help them. So a regular communication mm -hmm. with any tool I think that would be important because it's very difficult to have face to face or in person interaction mm -hmm. with the authorities but if we have a regular tool where we can submit our re recommendations and get their feedback as well it would be it would be uh, really good. So that, that was my question. Is there any tool or is there any process that we can establish? I think that's a very important question that we're navigating in the research grant because we work with, very closely with the health partners and also with community organizations. Mm -hmm. So this findings from the research study translated into knowledge and into different media like infographics and our research manuscripts and our workshop and summit is the place where we want to bring it to the health to different authorities who work with people mm -hmm. and also organizations who work with the people with living with cancer and also their family members. So I think it's important to keep doing the work that we are doing and also yeah. promoting that work in different ways we can. And one of that is like having um, Sa Cafe Scientifica, the consortium, and even having this newsletter, like you said, uh, reports, smaller reports and infographics shared with them and bring it to the table of the people who work with the uh, at a higher level working and looking at different resources shared yeah. in the region so that the care coordination and also the communication and also the collaboration of care exists between different interdisciplinary team members mm -hmm. who are supporting people in their psychosocial oncology and in the way they are going through. 